Oh, you can't sign this? I don't know. Every time I do that, it doesn't really work. Okay. I'll put it in the drawer. Okay. For, these are just for C-SPAN, so you still get to talk to the crowd. Is this better? Um, you've been, you've been a this way? 15 years. 15 years. Okay. Like this? Okay. And you still see? It's an interesting angle here. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, we're very pleased uh, to be hosting uh, two Risens here this evening. Uh, we have veteran journalist Jim uh, and uh, his son, also a journalist, Tom. Uh, and they're here to talk about uh, their new book, the Last Honest Man, the CIA, the FBI, the Mafia, and the Kennedys, and one senator's fight to save democracy. Uh, Jim, uh, of course, is a very uh, accomplished investigative reporter who uh, did some outstanding work uh, while with the, the New York Times, uh, where he was for, for nearly 20 years, from 1998 to uh, 2017. Uh, he was a member of the team that won the 2002 Pulitzer for explanatory reporting for coverage of the September 11 attacks. And then with a colleague, he shared the 2006 Pulitzer for national reporting for coverage of the NSA's domestic spying program. He's also written four uh, books uh, previously uh, about America's fight over abortion, about the CIA's final showdown with the KGB, about the CIA and the George W. Bush administration, and about the costs and consequences of America's war on terror in the first dozen years or so after 9-11. Currently, uh, he's senior national security correspondent uh, for The Intercept. Uh, his son, uh, Tom, uh, has been a journalist for 15, 16 uh, years, uh, and he's uh, 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 worked for uh, various news organizations uh, covered a, uh, and covered a wide range of local and uh, national topics, including uh, national security and, and U.S. politics. His current reporting uh, focuses on aviation. Uh, in The Last Honest Man, they uh, look back at the life of uh, former Democratic Senator Frank Church of Idaho, who was one of the most consequential lawmakers of the 20th century. Uh, he served in the Senate from the late 1950s through the 60s and, and 70s. Church emerged as an early opponent in Congress of the Vietnam War and also uh, later launched a landmark investigation into the rising global power of America's corporate giants. But he's best known for investigating in the mid-1970s decades of earlier abuses by the intelligence community. Church's disclosures shook the nation. The Senate committee hearings he chaired aired basic questions about the proper balance between liberty and security and, and the wide-ranging reforms he spearheaded 
resonate to this day. Uh, Jim and Tom credit church with nothing less than creating the rules of the road for the intelligence community, uh, rules that largely remain in place today. More than anyone else in American history, they write, church is responsible for bringing the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and the rest of the government's intelligence apparatus under the rule of law for the first time. Uh, now, the last honest man is not just an authoritative account of Church's life and work. It's a book that reads like an espionage thriller and imparts relevant lessons about government overreach and institutional oversight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, James Risen and Thomas Risen. Thanks. Is this on? Sure, okay. Thanks very much for having me, and uh, I, Bradley, and I really appreciate um, you, your time and coming out here. It's great to see everybody. Um, this has been really a labor of love uh, to actually um, uh, write a book with my son uh, is, is a phenomenal experience. And uh, to write about a man who I really admire um, has also been great. Uh, I've spent my life uh, writing about bad people doing bad things, and um, it was nice to have a change and write about a good man who did great things. And um, that was really why I wanted to do this book, uh, because I, I thought it was a, a time in America where we needed to remember some good people instead of uh, the people we have around these days. Um, who shall go nameless right now. Uh, and um, so Church was, Frank Church was a man who I think is really uh, out, of, out of his time at that time. He was, um, he was a classic American liberal who uh, ra became radicalized throughout his career. And it's very rare in American politics to see someone who is transformed uh, throughout their career and changes drastically um, and and is willing to evolve as a politician and that to me was fascinating to to understand and to write about um, and I think it led ultimately for a unique young man from uh, the Mountain West to go from a small conservative town in Idaho to lead the first major investigation of the CIA in the mid-1970s is an amazing transformation if you think about it. And that's what we tried to document was how he, how he got to where he ended up. Uh, he started out in Boise. Um, he was born in Boise in 1924 and, and um, was always considered the smartest kid in class uh, and became uh, one of the, he became probably uh, the class pet, if you will. All the kids sort of resented the fact that the teachers all loved him, but then they also realized he was smarter than them. And so they, uh, there wasn't much they could, they had to kind of respect his intelligence. Um, when he was in middle school, he got a, a letter to the editor in the Boise newspaper published on the front page because he uh, wanted to defend Senator William Bora of Idaho, uh, who was being criticized for his isolationism. Uh, and then a couple of years later, he won the national oratory contest of the American Legion by uh, presenting a a speech that was radically different from the letter to the editor he had just uh, written a couple years earlier. And his speech was essentially like the Four Freedoms speech of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, defending American democracy and the need for uh, regulation of American capitalism and uh, to fight against fascism in the world. And it was a remarkable transformation in just a couple of years. Um, and then he, he um, that the win in that competition got him a scholarship that he was used to go to Stanford and leave Boise. 
But then uh, with World War II, he, he ended up in the Army as an Army intelligence officer in China. He's one of the youngest officers in, Ameri in the Army at the time uh, and became uh, the briefer for the commanding general in China by 1945. Uh, and the, he had such a precise way of speaking at such a young age, he was only 20 when he was a, a, an army intelligence officer in China, um, that his, the commanding general of the uh, Chinese Combat Command for the US Army would have him, uh, put him basically on display and have him talk at dinner parties of American officers. And, uh, because, and he said that you have the best diction in the army. <laughs> and people, he began to resent it. He, he felt like he was just a uh, plaything of this general. And it's one of the early signs of his radicalization is that he resented and turned against uh, being, you know, part of this hierarchy that um, he felt was supporting a corrupt uh, uh, Chinese nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, he turned against um, the American military power very early on. He saw, he wrote letters back home uh, that are at the Frank Church Papers in Boise uh, where he talked, he was, wrote, he was felt revolted by the American um, atomic bombing of Japan, even though everyone else in the army in China was elated by it. Uh, and he came back to uh, the US he turned down an opportunity to stay in intelligence after the war, which might have led him to join the CIA if he had stayed in. Um, and he ended up uh, uh, going back to Boise and um, after he had suffered cancer, he went to law school and ran for Senate when he was only 32 um, and got elected. And um, when he was first elected, he was a, he was a very, um, he was a very uh, traditional, conventional, uh, uh, cold warrior, a democratic cold warrior of the 1950s. And it really wasn't until Vietnam that he was radicalized. Um, and so I would wanted to ask Tom to speak a little bit about what Church did not know while he was joining the Senate and become and uh, beginning to fight against the Vietnam War in the early 60s, he did not yet know much about the CIA because the CIA, there was no oversight of the CIA at that time. And we talk a little bit in the book about the growth of the CIA in the 1950s. Yeah, and uh, as uh, Dad mentioned, uh, there. The Armed Services Committees in Congress officially had oversight power, but as we know, Congress is very busy, and giving the Armed Services Committee one more thing to do is not ideal. So, and also, there was a lot of deference. So the CIA, FBI, et cetera, were able to pretty much do what they wanted and pay some lip service to the lawmakers. You know, ooh, ah, we're the FBI, we're the CIA. And so they pretty much did what they wanted. And uh, CIA was created uh, out of the wartime OSS in 1947. Its charter is sort of vague. One thing that's very, very clear is they are not allowed to operate inside the United States. And that's because President Harry Truman was very worried about uh, the United States secret police. He was already dealing with J. Edgar Hoover, who had, by this time, had been uh, leading the FBI for decades and would increasingly target leftists and African American groups, culminating in the 1960s COINTEL Pro program that the Church Committee would eventually investigate. And uh, in absence of this oversight, the uh, CIA did a lot of covert action that really would have turned heads if people were paying attention. Pretty much immediately, they started bribing governments in Italy and Japan with the aim of subverting communism. Uh, they overcorrected in that case and led to uh, some corporate corruption that Frank Church would also investigate in Japan. Uh, look it up in the book. So corruption begets more corruption. And uh, the CIA also uh, picked up the OSS uh, quest for the perfect interrogation drug that it started during World War II. They drugged prisoners looking for the best way to interrogate people, looking for a truth drug. 
they picked that up, expanded it, and called it MKUltra. And with, with the knowledge of President Eisenhower, they drugged Americans uh, without their knowledge, especially with LSD. It was the hot new drug of the 1950s. They were kind of obsessed with it. And uh, they also looked for the perfect torture method and created the first black sites in places like Germany, Japan, South Korea, South Vietnam, anywhere the military had a presence. Panama Canal, also a big area, because there was a military base there at the time. And uh, like I said, a big fi finding of the church committee was that presidents like Dwight Eisenhower pretty much knew what the CIA was doing. You know, If they didn't know, it's because they didn't want to know. But Eisenhower knew that Americans were being drugged without their knowledge. And uh, he wanted to use the CIA as a force of shadow American power. He didn't want a direct military confrontation with the Soviets, so he thought he would use it to subvert, you know, keep the status quo in favor of the Western powers of Europe and the United States. He used it to uh, stage coups in, in Iran in 1953, Guatemala in 1954, Congo in 1960, and kind of sought to replace European colonialism with American hegemony. And uh, helping him with this were the brothers Alan Dulles as director of CIA and John Foster Dulles as secretary of state. And neither of these men were particularly suited for their jobs. They were arrogant and elitist. Both their uncle and their grandfather had been secretary of state. That's how elitist they were. And they were pretty arrogant and had this foreign policy where there was zero room for even negotiation with communists. And uh, that was, like I said, overcorrecting. You know, communism is bad, but they overcorrected. And uh, Eisenhower was right there with him. He thought that the end of colonialism was a destructive hurricane, as we write in the book. And uh, that helped lead to the disaster of the Vietnam War, where France is uh, dealing with counterinsurgency for the better part of a decade since the end of World War II. It doesn't go well. They make a lot of mistakes that the American army will later repeat pretty frighteningly. And uh, so by the time... Uh, Frank Church is in the Senate, and he visits Vietnam in 1962. It's pretty clear that the Saigon government is corrupt. The U.S. military has been supporting and abetting them. Britain and France refused to help because there was supposed to be a treaty, the Geneva Accords, that would have united Vietnam uh, through an election. Ho Chi Minh probably would have won. He was incredibly popular. He was a communist. Communists were killing rival independence groups, so there was already a civil war brewing. Think there was going to be blood. The United States just made it worse. And that's, so Frank Church visits Vietnam in 1962, yeah. and he notices things are not going well. Yeah, when Church arrived uh, in 1962, um, President Kennedy, who he was, he was very close to Kennedy, uh, had uh, wanted him and some other senators to tour Vietnam. And he went there, and he was just shocked by um, the corruption and the incompetence of the South Vietnamese regime. Um, and it reminded him completely of the Chinese uh, nationalist army and the Chinese nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and he went back to Washington and began slowly to turn against the war. He was, uh, since he was so close to Kennedy, he was, very discreet and subtle about his criticisms of the war at first. Um, he turned, he, he would criticize the, the South Vietnamese government, but he wouldn't criticize the Kennedy administration's policies openly. Um, and it was really only when uh, Lyndon Johnson became president that he began to turn openly against uh, the U.S. policy in uh, Vietnam. And his relationship with Lyndon Johnson uh, went downhill very fast. He had, uh, Johnson had been Senate Majority Leader when uh, Church was first elected to uh, the Senate. And they had had a very up and down relationship while he was in the Senate, very uh, volatile. But now it went completely south because uh, Church was willing to be very open in his opposition to the war. And he was the first major uh, senator for who Johnson considered credible to openly turn against the war. And he really pressured um, William Fulbright, who was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time, uh, to hold hearings on Vietnam. Um, and it was the pressure, I think, from Church uh, that finally helped force 
uh, Fulbright's hearings, which were a watershed moment in uh, the mid-1960s on Vietnam, and it helped legitimize opposition to the war. <clears throat> and then later in the, uh, during the war, Church became very frustrated that Congress was having so little impact on ending the war uh, that he became deeply depressed. And he finally began to push uh, for uh, Congress to defund the war and defund the military operations. He started on the edges of that with uh, a series of legislative moves called the Cooper Church Amendments, which began with um, efforts to stop any military operations in Thailand and then moved to try, trying to stop military operations in Cam Cambodia, and then finally uh, trying to defund all military operations in Vietnam itself. And I think historians today uh, agree that uh, it was the Cooper Church Amendments and similar actions in Congress which finally helped force Nixon and Henry Kissinger to begin to accelerate and intensify peace negotiations with uh, North Vietnam and uh, ultimately led to the uh, peace accords of 1973. Uh, and I think that was uh, really Church doesn't get the credit that he deserves uh, for uh, his role in helping to end the Vietnam War. And uh, it, as I said earlier, he, he, was, he started in the 1950s when he got to Congress as kind of a Cold War hawk uh, much like John Kennedy was. Uh, it was, it was the Democratic uh, mainstream of the late 1950s was very hawkish. Uh, and they were trying to be uh, more hawkish than the Republicans in the wake of the McCarthy era. Um, and Church really uh, evolved from that. He was transformed by Vietnam much more than any other uh, senator he became a real radical by the late 1960s and early 1970s. And he, compare, he began to compare the United States to the Soviet Union. He thought that the, the United States was becoming a militaristic empire that uh, was a dangerous force in the world, just like the Soviet Union. And his speeches, if you read them today, are just shockingly uh, uh, leftist. Uh, for a senator from Idaho. And probably the only thing, his, his, <laughs> the, the main political benefit that he received was that uh, he had this split personality. On the one side, he was becoming this radical. On the other side, he was deeply politically ambitious, and he wanted to be president. And he was extremely good at navigating how to present his radical views in Idaho to an increasingly conservative audience. Uh, and he did that in a remarkable way by just being honest with them and by telling them exactly what he thought. And it's kind of refreshing to see what he was saying to people in Idaho in 1968 when he had to run for re-election in the midst of the Vietnam War. And he would go from county courthouse to the, from one county courthouse to the other and he would sit down with people and talk about Vietnam and explain why he was turning against the war and why he was afraid of what it was doing to the nation. And people in Idaho accepted it. And they saw that as, well, he's, he's explained it to me. He sits down with me and he talks about it in, in simple English. And um, it worked. And it's remarkable that more politicians don't try honesty occasionally. Uh, and, um, and yet Idaho was becoming more conservative over time. And so uh, he, he realized eventually, by the mid-1970s, he realized, I think, that uh, the state was turning against him. Um, and um, he wasn't sure how long he was going to be able to continue in, uh, in the Senate. Um, but he... Uh, and he, he had this dual view, I think, of his life. One, as I said, he was deeply politically ambitious, but becoming radical. 
and I think that's the great tragedy of his life was that he never quite figured out how to resolve that duality in his life of being a radical who was very worried about the future of the United States as a republic. He thought it was going to become an imperial power that was unaccountable. Uh, and yet, he still wanted to be president of the United States or at least chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I don't think he ever resolved that. How do, how do you navigate that? those two completely opposing thoughts? Uh, and that climaxed in 1975 when he was he wanted to run the church committee, but he also wanted to run for president. And he did both. And it, it was kind of his ultimate, uh, the ultimate problem he never quite uh, resolved in his mind or in his career. Because while he ran the church committee, he was being criticized by many people who thought that it was just, he was just using it as a platform to run for president. <laughs> And then when he, he waited, because he wanted to complete the church committee, he waited too long to get into the presidential campaign. And so he lost in the primaries to Jimmy Carter. Um, and so I think that was, it was an interesting uh, problem I think a lot of politicians have is never quite knowing how far to push their ideals versus their ambitions. Um, but I think, um, the church committee itself um, is just another whole other part of our book that is so, it becomes so dramatic uh, that his life really begins in a lot of ways in, in January 1975 when he uh, becomes chairman of the church committee. Um, and it's uh, a committee that looking back, it's amazing that what they accomplished, they had uh, there had never been, as Tom said, never been any oversight of um, the CIA or the FBI or the NSA before. And the church committee had to decide, once it was created, what to look at and uh, what to, you know, they had 30 years of past uh, history of the CIA and they had to decide what to investigate. Um, and the first thing that they decided to investigate were a series, a series of uh, efforts by the CIA to assassinate foreign leaders. And that led them very quickly as they began to investigate that to uh, a secret CIA alliance with the mafia that had uh, occurred during the uh, uh, late Eisenhower and early Kennedy administrations. And then as they began to investigate that, their witnesses started getting murdered. And so uh, Tom did a great job in our research in getting the um, files on two of those murders. One was Sam Giancana, uh, who was the mob boss of Chicago. And the other was Johnny Rosselli, who was one of the most flamboyant mobsters uh, from Hollywood and Las Vegas. And why don't you talk about the murder of Sam Giancana? Yeah, uh, the church committee investigated I think, five assassinations, and the most pro one that got the most headlines was uh, the plot between the CIA and the mafia to kill Fidel Castro. Uh, the mafia, you may remember, had casinos in Havana up until Castro took over, and CIA thought, hey, they hit Castro too. Let's, let's enlist them and see, what, see if they can help kill him. And uh, so they reached out through uh, a fixer of theirs. They had a former FBI agent named uh, Robert Mayhew, one of those guys who knows everyone, including someone in the mafia. And that friend of his, Johnny Rosselli, another guy who knows everyone. You know, the intelligence and crime worlds depend on people who know everyone and pass secrets, you know, between trusted people. Johnny Rosselli was one of those guys. And uh, so he brought in Sam Giancana and Sansa Traficante. They plotted to uh, poison Castro with patolinum poison. And um, so by the time 1975 comes along, Sam Giancana is uh, subpoenaed properly or just requested to arrive. Because they had subpoena power in the committee, but you know you don't always use it. People know you have it, so you show up. So Sam Giancana was about to be interviewed 
by church committee staffers, but he's murdered in his basement. And to this day, no one knows who. But also to this day, the Oak Park Police Department is still considering it a cold case. I think they did DNA tests in the 2000s with cigarette butts that were left at the scene. So they're still looking. And uh, Miami police are also still looking for uh, Johnny Rosselli. Johnny Rosselli did survive to testify before the church committee. And uh, about a year later, he was found chopped up into pieces in a barrel in Dumbfoundling Bay near Miami. So uh, they're still looking for who killed him too. But uh, everyone pretty much agrees that it was uh, Tony Accardo, who was the kingmaker. He was the power behind the throne of Chicago. And never spent a day in prison. One of the reasons he, did, he was able to do that is he killed almost everyone who he did business with, including Johnny Rosselli and Sam Giancana. One of the things that's uh, so fascinating is that um, throughout, as Tom said, these two murders have never been solved. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of pundits in the press at the time and uh, other people dismissed the idea that they might have been murdered for talking to the church committee. Um, but I think that the mo mob, the mafia never, I, in my opinion, are doing some, a lot of research on this, these two murders. I don't think the mafia kills people for any one reason. I think there's a, usually a lot of reasons. And I think it's usually because people are talking too much. Uh, both, uh, Giancana was taught, was testifying before a, a federal grand jury, uh, and, uh, uh, Rosselli also was talking to an, a separate grand jury uh, when, when they were killed. Uh, they were all, but they were also talking to the church committee. And so I think uh, the issue is that they were talking too much in general, and part of who they were talking to was the church committee. So I think the idea that you can dismiss the fact that they were murdered because they were talking to the church committee is not true. And one thing that we found that no one else we disclose in the book for the first time was that there was a third witness murdered, and that was Orlando Letelier, who was the oh, he was the uh, Chilean dissident who had um, fled Chile when uh, Salvador Allende's government was overturned was overthrown, and uh, the Pinochet government assassinated him. But what wasn't known until our book was that. He was secretly um, being interviewed by the Church Committee, uh, which did a major investigation of U.S. policy, the covert action in, uh, in Chile. And um, so it, to have three witnesses all murdered uh, is, uh, I think, a congressional record. <laughs> uh, and I think it, it's amazing, one of the, the things at the time, the Justice Department and the FBI did not want to investigate either the Giancana murder or the Rosselli murder. Uh, they wanted to leave it up to local police in both cases. And one of the members of the church committee, Gary Hart, decided that, it, that, was, that he was shocked that the Justice Department wasn't doing anything about it. And so he and a few other staffers went to Miami to try to investigate the Rosselli murder on their own. And they met with the Miami-Dade police and put them in touch with the CIA and gave them as much help as they could. Um, but I think, but the um, Rosselli murder was never solved. One of the interesting things was that the two uh, homicide detectives for Miami-Dade uh, police force were later uh, charged in a, um, in a very complex drug trafficking and corruption case. Um, and Tom was able to talk to both of them about whether that had any effect on their willingness or eagerness to solve the Rosselli murder. Yeah, uh, it seems like it was just, you know, the 70s and early 80s in Miami and, you know, far from the first police officers to get involved in the coke trade back then. There was just so much of it. and. Uh, uh, another thing we discovered is Santo Traficante got a phone call from a payphone that was down the street from Johnny Rosselli's house the day he disappeared. That doesn't look good. Yeah, I think <laughs> the FBI clearly believes, and the, I think the Miami-Dade police clearly believe that Santo Traficante was behind uh, Johnny Rosselli's murder. And Santo Traficante is the only uh, mob figure 
who was involved in the alliance with the CIA to kill Castro, who never testified and was never killed. It was a, a big deal with the investigation of the police officers because he was the drug kingpin in Florida before the cartels really, you know, became huge. So we were wondering if there was a connection there. It turns out there wasn't. But it was, it was still, you got to wonder whether uh, corrupt cops were the best people to investigate a mob hit. <laughs> So should we move to questions, or uh, should we keep going for a while? I was going to ask you about that, the name you mentioned, Bob Mayhew or something. Bob Mayhew. Yeah. He's the one that put the bomb underneath Orlando Lucilier's car. No, no, that was somebody else. Really? Yeah. He was busy with Howard Hughes by then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say something about the impact. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. The... Um, I think the, the church committee um, had, I think, a real historic legacy, and it was very consequential. I think there's a lot of historians who now recognize that it was probably the most important congressional investigation in American history. Um, it's, it had a water, it was a watershed moment for American intelligence. It brought the CIA and the FBI and the NSA under the rule of law, uh, it the, because of the investigations uh, of the past abuses by the CIA and the FBI and the NSA, uh, new laws were were passed, um, especially during the Carter administration when the Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate and the White House, and um, the. Uh, there's a number of laws that are now on the book, that remain on the books that still rein in the power of the intelligence community. Those laws are flawed and not as good as they should be, but they're the only, but, but prior to the church committee, none of those rules existed. Uh, one example is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the, what we now call FISA, which uh, is widely uh, criticized today for all of its... Uh, failures, but um, it didn't, it was the first uh, law that ever limited the power of the intelligence community to eavesdrop on American citizens. And um, other laws like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was passed as a result of Church's investigation of multinational uh, bribery of uh, foreign governments. And there were, uh, the creation of permanent Senate and House Intelligence commi uh, Committees was a direct result of the Church Committee. Uh, we wouldn't, ha there was no oversight prior to the Church Committee. And really, Frank Church saw his goal, his objective with the Church Committee was to set the stage for the creation of a permanent oversight committee in the Senate because he knew he had to uh, lead this committee in a way that was would be broadly acceptable to both parties and to the White House and to the intelligence community in order to uh, set the stage for the creation of, a, of permanent oversight. And uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee was created just a couple months after the completion of the uh, Church Committee's work. Uh, and there were a number of other uh, executive orders and administrative changes both at the FBI and the CIA and the NSA, that uh, all really uh, were put in place because of the Church Committee's work. And the Church Committee had such an important uh, impact on the growth and the, and the uh, role of the intelligence community in American society that after 9-11, Dick Cheney uh, began to attack it. Um, if you remember, Dick Cheney had been deputy chief of uh, staff of the White House in the Ford White House when the church committee was, uh, was operating. And he hated the church committee. He wanted to try to stop it and block its access to documents. Um, but Jerry Ford, who was a new president, who, had just, who was the president as a result of the Watergate scandal, didn't want another fight with Congress. And so he uh, continually ignored Cheney as Cheney kept demanding uh, a tougher approach, uh, a more hard-edged approach to the church committee. 
And so when he was vice president after 9-11, he finally saw his chance and he attacked the church committee repeatedly. And he blamed, basically he blamed Frank Church, who had been dead for 20 years, for 9-11. Uh, and uh, claimed that the church committee had been, uh, that the, Im the reforms imposed by the church committee were to blame for the failures of the intelligence community uh, at the time in 9-11. And he, uh, he and other Republicans continued to attack the church committee for several years after that, uh, including in the uh, hearings on the intelligence uh, uh, reorganization law that went into place in 2004. Uh, but it was finally when the war in Iraq started going badly and the war on terror began to be seen for all of its abuses uh, the fact that Dick Cheney didn't like it became uh, actually a positive for the legacy of the church committee. And within about uh, 10 years of 9-11, people were starting to say, we need a new church committee to investigate Dick Cheney and George Bush and everything that they've done. And um, today, every time that there is a, uh, a major scandal in, in Washington, people to say we need a new church committee and it chur the church committee has become a, syn a really a synonym for uh, in American politics for uh, a truth and reconciliation commission um, and it's become a shorthand for any major uh, congressional investigation so much so that the great irony today is that Republicans who attacked it under the Bush administration uh, now say that Jim Jordan's new weaponization committee is the new church committee. Oh, God. And um, they are calling themselves the heirs of Frank Church, which is kind of the opposite. Uh, but it shows the degree to which the phrase, the church committee, has gone into uh, American political lore as just a name for any major effort to understand uh, American uh, abuses and scandals. And so I think that's, you know, Frank Church uh, has, it's kind of like Elvis, he's had a good afterlife, you know. <laughs> and uh, people had forgotten him in the 1980s and 90s, and today uh, the church committee has been revived in American history. Thanks, thanks very much. Be open to any questions. You guys. Do you want to come to a stand? Mm -hmm. So going back to the earlier part of your, it was a fascinating discussion. Uh, you just forgot to mention the anti-war movement, which also had something to do with ending the war in Vietnam yeah, yeah. and the draft. Right. Um, but going back to the to your your description of uh, church as someone. Who became radical? Who was from Idaho and became radicalized? Did did people around him? Did he talk to people around him as to why he thought Idaho was moving the way it was? I mean, Idaho has become symbolic of white militia. I mean, yeah. the, the the worst of the worst. They, they want to form their own white supremacy state. Right. Right. Um, and it's so odd to have someone like that. Yeah. like church from a place like Idaho. Right. And he apparently sensed that things were going the way they ultimately went. Right. Did he ever say, or did you hear why he thought that was happening? Yeah, well, the, this man would know he was his Senate campaign manager. Oh. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the, um, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that um, Idaho, when he first got into politics, um, was, wasn't quite a swing, what we would call a swing state, but it wasn't far off, really. Mm -hmm. uh, f the, one of the things that really shocked me was that uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman won Idaho for five straight presidential elections. Wow. From 1932 to 1948. Wow. Uh, there were a lot of Democrats elected both to, govern to the governorship, to the Senate, the House, 
over the, uh, throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s and 70s. Cecil Andrus uh, was governor of Idaho fairly recently. He was mm -hmm. a, one of the most popular governors in Idaho history. Um, and so it really is a fairly recent, you know, if you step back, it's a fairly recent trend to see what's happened to Idaho, really only since the 80s, I would say. But he began to see in the 1970s, it was really the 70s when he began to see the change. Um, his 1970, in 1974, he ran for re-election. And he kind of took it for granted because he'd always won fairly easily. And he ran against a nobody. Uh, and, and it was a close race. And I think that 1974 election shook him and led him, I think, to decide to run for president because I think he knew it was going to get very difficult for him to get getting reelected in Idaho. And I think it was also he decided then that he had to do as many big things in Washington as he could. And I think in the, I, I can't prove this, but I think in the back of his mind, the church committee idea uh, fit in with his belief that he didn't have much longer to go in uh, the Senate from Idaho. One of his uh, best quotes uh, was, America is a conservative nation that's willing to vote liberal. And I think that's how he viewed Idaho and why he campaigned on the issues is because he thought, I have to persuade them. They're willing, I just have to convince them. But he still, I mean, he still almost won re-election in 1980. It was a very close race. Uh, he only lost by about 4,000 votes. Interesting. In, in the Reagan landslide. Reagan destroyed Carter in Idaho, but uh, Church almost won. And um, there's a lot of people who still believe it was because Jimmy Carter conceded so early that night. I remember that well. And uh, uh, the, uh, and it, the funny thing is, that one of the, shocking things to me that about Idaho that I now know I'm I it was to me it was like a great study uh, in learning about a state that I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. um, North Idaho which is now militia central mm -hmm. was a democratic stronghold for Frank Church it was the strongest democratic area of the whole state for decades and because it was filled with uh, union workers for mines and lumber. Uh -huh. and, uh, okay. and it really was only after the mines and the timber operations began to close that um, conservatives began to move in and take over in those Interesting, areas. interesting, interesting. And one of the, one of the old time uh, Democrats who, uh, who, from that time period told me that uh, whenever church was worried about an election, he would say, he would say, "Well, you just wait till the North comes in," and that would not be a good answer today. <laughs> and is is that is that what you think? Is that what he is that what he thought that because the unions were collapsing as the as industry was collapsing in Idaho? That was a big factor. Interesting. And, uh, and also, you had uh, you had the national environment who, after the, the, the hostages were taken in Iran, True. And, True. and Church's chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, people thought he cared more about the politics of Pakistan than the price uh, of potatoes. Ah, uh, okay, Idaho. okay. And when you get into that kind of situation, okay, it's you're tough. in trouble. It's tough. Thank you. Thank this you. Is, Thank you. By the way, this is Peter Fenn, who was uh, he worked on the Church Committee and was. Uh, a very close friend of the church family and a great source for my book. Wow. Very nice. <laughs> nice to meet you. Buy his book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I, I did buy uh, the great. book, found it in a uh, bookstore in Georgetown. Great. So that's why I'm here, and I'm so grateful to be, because I picked up a copy, I have no idea when, somewhere around 2005 from a note I have in here, alleged assassination plots, mm -hmm. uh, uh, interim report of the select committee. To yeah. And there's an introduction by Frank Church. Right. Which, which I, um, and yeah, then I, was, yeah. I pick up this book at the library uh, uh, when I first heard about this event uh, uh, way back whenever oh, by okay. Loke uh, Johnson. I oh, see yeah, he, by he's Locke, in yeah. your book. Yeah. 
the reason I came up to the microphone, because uh, I love listening to this, um, I was listening with particularly an interest to the mafia, the, the mafia, and I, yeah. I have concluded in my years in study and research that there is no distinguish, distinguishable difference between the Central Intelligence Agency, especially, and the mafia. They do. Uh, there is a reason why they collaborated, why they worked together. It goes back to World War II, actually, with the OSS, but I won't go there. Yeah, I mean, I think the, that one of the one of the issues yeah. uh, during the 1950s and early 60s was that there were no rules. And uh, you're right. I mean, the the people today on the right talk about a deep state, and they talk about uh, this conspiracy theory that. Um, there is, an, uh, there is this huge part of the government, the secret government, that um, is totally rogue. I, I argue in my book that that was true in an earlier time period and that the church committee really reigned that in. And, I, and yes, the, the fact that senior CIA officials thought it was a good idea to work with the mafia uh, to kill a foreign leader is something that was uh, was of a piece of that era of the CIA, and so I think we're not doing that anymore. Well, not as far as I know. Seymour, <laughs> uh, you mentioned Dick Cheney. This is very important for yeah. everyone to know because you read Cy Hirsch's book. Chain, I think it's called Chain of Command. Yeah, it talks about yeah. how Cheney, Dick Cheney, came in, and uh, he, if anything, he wanted to deflect attention at his responsibility for 9/11. But again, I won't go there. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I, well, is, I, yeah, uh, I wrote a lot about but, that myself. But here, here's my point. Yeah. And, and this is also what people need to know, because there's also no distinguishable difference. When it comes to the intelligence community, war and peace between the Democrat and Republican Party, I cite, paraphrasing, one Senate majority, lead, now Senate majority leader, Charles Schumer. I'll never forget seeing this. And he was saying, I'll meet the press, I believe, at, soon after Trump uh, uh, was elected. And paraphrasing, but he said something to the effect that they have a way of getting back at you, meaning the intelligence committee, either that or he was talking specifically about the CIA, six ways to Sunday. That that was the phrase. That, and he was like kind of joking about it. And it was very chilling to me to hear that because yeah. I definitely do believe that President John F. Kennedy had his head blown off in the middle of a city street in broad daylight. And the only people who had that ability, capability, and certainly motive, and to cover it up, of course, all these years, was the Central Intelligence Agency community, the intelligence community today. Right. One difference is the mafia is more effective than the CIA. So they're not <laughs> capable of killing the president. That's a big thing. Is If the, ma the mafia didn't want to do it, that would have been too much heat. Castro didn't want to do it, that would have been too much heat. Same with the FBI, CIA. But if the mafia or Castro had tried to do it, they would have been more effective than the agency. So that's my yeah, view. I think, I think that's... But how are, the point is, how are we to assess progress with the Frank, Frank Church Committee, which I, I agree that, was important to, to today, I think where, the, where people are openly talking about throwing away any ideas of a republic in the name of, oh, I don't like the election right. results. Right. How, yeah, do we, no, how do we deal with this? I think that's, you know, it's, uh, it's a constant struggle to try to rein in and reform government. And I think um, one of the, 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 the church committee had unfinished business. Uh, it, it began the process of reform. It reined in the power of the intelligence community to a degree which I think makes it so that it is not uh, a deep state. I think a deep st the idea of a deep state today is a conspiracy theory. But I do think that there more reform needs to be done and uh, that we need something like the church committee again uh, to, to uh, impose new reforms. I just don't. Th I just don't thank think. You. Thank, I just, thank you for refocusing. I just don't think Jim Jordan is the answer. So. <laughs> Um, yeah. How did uh, church talk to uh, people from um, Idaho in the 60s when he tried to persuade them or, or, or talk about his opposition to the war in Vietnam? 
It was, it was fascinating because he was very honest about it. He would give some of the same kind of speeches in Idaho that he gave in Washington. Uh, and he had, a, um, he had a, a habit of every year going um, to every county courthouse in, all, in Idaho, and he would sit down in the courthouse and let anybody come and talk to him. What and were so some of the was, things he said? He would, he would explain exactly, uh, I don't have his speeches in front of me, but he, he would explain exactly his positions on Vietnam, why he felt that the war uh, had to be stopped, why he thought that the um, Johnson administration's policies were flawed. And um, he had the benefit, I think, in 1967 and 68, of the fact that Idaho was turning against Lyndon Johnson and uh, that his opposition to the war was seen sort of as uh, opposition to Lyndon Johnson uh, rather than being purely anti-war. And so when Republicans tried to uh, attack him for being anti-war and being soft on communism, a lot of uh, Idaho voters didn't, didn't buy that because, the, first of all, they knew him pretty well by that time. And um, he, he, as I said, he was, uh, it's remarkable, he wasn't trying to be two different people. He was saying pretty much the same thing in Idaho as he did in Washington. Did you find that when he was running for president, did he modulate his views at all in terms of, and as Idaho was becoming more conservative, did, did you find that he modulated his views at all? Not as much as you would think. I mean, one of the things, if you read his, uh, his announcement speech, in 1976, when he announced he was running for president, he announced in Idaho City, which is a little old uh, mining town, and his speech was filled with discussions of how uh, the United States was becoming an Im imperial power and it had to be reined in, and that he <laughs> saw what he had done on the church committee, which was the previous year, as essential to uh, to uh, changing and transforming America back into a republic. Um, he did, uh, at, when he began to worry about the 1980 Senate re-election, he began to uh, moderate some of his positions. But um, it was much less than you might think. I mean, I think he knew by that time, people knew him pretty much for who he was. Uh, you know, and he ran, he led the fight in the Senate on the Panama Canal Treaty, which was deeply unpopular in, um, in Idaho. Uh, and he did that knowing that it was going to be a major problem for him in the uh, 1980 Senate re uh, election. One last thing. Um, I remember during the debates between Carter and Reagan in 80 that when Carter was talking about the CAA, he suddenly became muted for a few minutes. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you remember that? Does, do people remember that? It was a, he was muted for a few minutes, yeah. and they were trying to get the sound back. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Do you think that the CIA killed a Yandy? No. He was killed in the coup plot. In the, yeah. yeah. They wanted him gone, but uh, they didn't do it. They, they might have had a part for one coup. Yeah. On the, in the New York Post, there's a phrase that democracy dies in the darkness. Do you think that democracy as it relates to the scandals and abuses that democracy could die in the darkness and what would church say about like you know our governing system or body that could come after if democracy died in the darkness that's a good question i think i think today if frank church was here today he would be a very progressive democrat i think he would be on the left left of the democratic party and i think it was he would be shocked by the inequality in our society today. Uh, and uh, I think he would have found uh, the actions of the US government after 9-11 and the war on terror just, uh, he would have been revolted by them. And I think he would have rebelled much more than any other Democrat did during the war on terror. Um, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, he. he Frank Church in 1976 ran a very progressive campaign. He supported the Equal Rights Amendment, supported decriminalization of marijuana. He was kind of muted on gun control because that was his safe issue with Idaho, because that was the thing they really wanted. And he you know, was kind of muted on that. 
But uh, he also gave some really good speeches like, we need to look after each other, we're starting to eat each other, our society has to be supportive of one another. And a really good speech he gave about the church committee was, we have to be afraid of uh, the abyss from which there is no return. Because he said, if the wrong people are at the helm of our intelligence community, they have surveillance abilities and all these other you know, tools that they could use to run a surveillance deep state. And because of the church committee, we don't have one. And were such leaders as Martin Luther King under investigation? Yeah, I, well that was one of the landmark investigations of the church committee was to, they were the ones who uncovered and disclosed the FBI's long, uh, decade-long harassment and abuse of Martin Luther King. And it, that really came out, uh, pretty much everything we know about what the FBI did to Martin Luther King came from the church committee. And the Black Panthers, and you know, there's a whole chapter on Hoover and the FBI. Sure. Uh, just one uh, quick question. Sure. Um, you think that if he were here today, I'm sorry, if he were here today, you were mentioning earlier you think that he would still look for some more reforms that were needed for the, I hate the term deep state because it's been so abused. It's, right. And right. I actually have a great deal of confidence in the intelligence community as a general matter of being professional and so forth. What do you think he would look to do now about, for example, the collection of metadata? I think that whole investigation has been left sort of hanging. A lot of really good work has been done. You're prominent for that. There's some other people that have done great work. But it just sits. What do you think he might say about that, or what do you think he might do about that? I think he, beginning uh, after 9-11, I think he would have fought and rebelled against the growth of the national security state uh, that uh, Bush and Cheney pushed. I think he would have been much more uh, aggressive in investigating and pushing that than any other Democrat has been. And I think that's what he would probably see is, I think he would be depressed by how the Democratic Party has uh, did not yep. do more aggressive investigations of torture and uh, surveillance and other things like that. And I think he would have, I think that would have, he would really have uh, focused on that. Yeah, I don't think we have anybody in American life now who's really focused on it in a, right. in a, in a, in a coherent way. Right. Thank you. Thanks.